أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله فيقتلون ويقتلون وعدا عليه حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بأهده من الله فاستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به وذلك هو الفوز العظيم سلك الله العلي العظيم سلوة الله محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I thank him for giving us this opportunity to exist to recognize him as I always mention and for the ability to be given limited free will. Limited free will meaning we don't have total free will, we have limited free will. Why do I say limited? Because we don't have the capacity to have total free will. It's absurd to say that, for example, that we have um, total free will. Total free will means if I decide not to be a human being and I want to be another creature, I can be that. I want to change my date of birth, I can do that. I don't like the earth to be a sphere, I want it to be a cube, I can change it. I want to go back in time, I can do it. That's total free will, you know. I want something to exist, I want something not to exist. No one has total free will except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lahu mulku samawati wal ard. The universe belongs to him and he is the only one who has total free will. Not even prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, messengers of Allah have total free will. Nobody has free will but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please understand that. Our holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Even he doesn't have total free will. We say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolu. We bear witness he is the servant of God and the messenger of Allah. So first and foremost, our tawheed must always be kept in focus. And the reason it is important to constantly reiterate, to constantly remind ourselves of the necessity of Allah and the purity of tawheed, because Allah is the absolute good. All good comes from Allah. When people ask us, why do you believe in God? Say, God is all good. I know my only one function in life, which will give me success, is to be good. When you, if I am a good person and I promote only good, and therefore I stop evil, stopping evil is also good. Not just doing good and ignoring evil. No, doing good and stopping evil. Stopping people who lie, stopping people who gossip, stopping people who cheat, stopping people who harm others, who hurt others, who take the right of orphans, who take justice away and bring injustice. Allah says you won't be successful unless you do tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr. You have to enjoin justice, haq and truth and patience. This is the enjoyment of good. So when people ask us, why do you believe in God? Say, God is the absolute good. There is no comparison to him. Lahu shay, for example. Lahu mulku samawati Everything belongs to him. When God decrees a matter, you see, he says, kun fayakun. Ma kana lillahi an yattakhidahu walada subhanahu. إِذَا قَضَىٰ أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ 
kun fayakun. It is not for Allah to take a son for himself. There are 2.2 billion people who are good Christians who believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a son or has a son. When that tawheed gets tainted, then the good starts to shift. Haram starts to become halal. For example, in the time of Isa alayhi salam, alcohol and pork was haram. But because this intrusion came into place, which was not true, that Isa indeed, Jesus is indeed not the son of God, and when you blur Allah, then you create atheism more readily. I hate to say this, but if you statistically study atheists, you'll find they were typically ex-Christians and Jews. Typically. There are Muslims, you know, there are atheists who were Muslims, but they're a minority, majority. And part of the reason for this is because when we taint Tawheed, the whole system goes haywire. Look, for example, with common sense, and I'm not bashing Christianity. Please, that's not my intent. I believe our Christian brethren are Ahl al kitabis They are our brethren in humanity. They're good people. They have good intentions. So it's not about that. Even when I speak about Khilafah, I'm not attacking Sunnis against Shia. It's not to do with that. I'm discussing an Islamic matter among the Muslims for us all to become better Muslims, not damnation and condemnation. When I talk about Christianity, it is not to damn and condemn the Christians to hell. It is to bring the human race to one truth. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Come, O people of the book, let's have a dialogue that we worship none other than one God. Why this need? Why Luqman says to his son, Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Why is Luqman paying attention to this fundamental fact? Because if you taint tawheed, you taint good. The source of good gets tainted. And haram will become halal and halal. In philosophy, there's a study called eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the hereafter. Barzakh. Life after death is known as eschatology. You find some religions reject it. Some believe that paradise is only for some people. There is a lot of injustice in religion and religious studies. When you study it, you'll find that people have misrepresented the deen of Allah and made religion sometimes very rigid. Or it appears free, but it actually knocks out the rest of humanity. Or the idea that God has chosen us as a people by birth because our mothers belong to that group. You know who I'm talking about. And they claim to be the chosen people of God. And Allah challenges that in Surah Al-Jum'ah. قُلْ يَا يُوَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ لِلَّهِ مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ You claim to be chosen people of God over all of mankind. Allah says, this is not my system. I do choose. Of course I have chosen people. But the chosen people are based on merit. Not by lineage. Not by skin color. Not by geography, you see, not by the acquisition of wealth, not by height, not by skin color, not by race. No. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. O mankind, we made you into male and female nations and tribes, so you know each other. لتعارفوا. Indeed, the most honorable to Allah is one who is God conscious. One who is aware of Allah, is aware of the reason for existence, is aware of the presence of God in all that is good. And they constantly promote good and they are aware that they have been created for a purpose and they are aware that they are being tested 
and they are aware that they are liable, and they know that their misbehavior causes damage in the society, and they will pay a price for it. That is the one Allah says, Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum. Who is the muttaqi? ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. In this book, Quran, there is no doubt. Who are they? To the ones who are muttaqin. You see? الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون. You see? They believe in the unseen. Unseen is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unseen is what? Tomorrow, day of judgment. Unseen are the angels. See? Unseen is barzakh. There are many unseen. You notice we as a human race put the greatest value in the ability to capture the unseen. More than the seen. When you see something and you touch it, it's not as valuable as that which you cannot see. For example, in the stock market, if you study all the charts of yesterday and today, after the market closed, although today is Saturday, but yesterday when the market closed, that data is old stuff. We want the data for Monday. If you can get your hands on the data for Monday, just one day, you will be the richest person in the world. Because you leverage all your stocks and options in the right direction. Because you can see the chart. You'll know when to buy cheap and sell high. But it's not known yet. It's not tangible. Ghayb. Hidden. And Allah is showing me that power in the Quran. Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'a. To Allah is the knowledge of time. That's why... He is Jabbar. That is why he is Allah. That is why he is Almighty. Allah says, I created time. You don't know. I'll tell you what can happen. And Allah does. The, the Romans were defeated in the Prophet's time. In Surah Al-Rum. And the pagans of Mecca came and said, Aha, you see, Romans are worshippers of God because they were Christians of the time. And they were, quote-unquote, monotheists. And the pagans of Mecca were on the side of the Persians because the Persians were idolaters. They were idol worshippers, and they saw them as friends. And they saw the Romans more with the Muslims. So they taunted the holy prophets. As you see, these believers in God, they lost. So Allah replies, Ghulibati Rum, Right? The Romans have been defeated, but Allah says, Soon they will recapture and they will win. And it's true. Soon the Romans turned around and defeated the Persians. The Quran spoke about the future with such clarity that were that not to have happened, then the Quran would have been marginalized permanently. One wrong sentence destroys the entire efficacy of the religion of Allah. Just think about that. The Quran states with Clarity, what will happen tomorrow. With clarity, what happened in the past. Even our religions of the world today don't have answers to many things, like Haman. Do you know scientists have studied Haman? Haman was a contemporary of Pharaoh. You'll find in the Christian scriptures in the Bible, all Egyptian kings are called pharaohs. Just FYI. All Egyptian kings, even in Yusuf's time, they called him Pharaoh. But the word Pharaoh, Pharaoh, did not exist in the time of Yusuf. When they got the papyrus and the hieroglyphics of the Egyptian writings, they noticed that Pharaoh, the name, did not exist in Yusuf's time. You will notice in Surah Yusuf, the king is never addressed as Pharaoh, is addressed as Melek, king. Quran never calls him Pharaoh. And you see the movie Yusuf, which the Islamic Republic, mashallah, has created a beautiful job in describing the life of Yusuf. The king is never addressed as Pharaoh. And they accuse the Muslims of saying Pharaoh, uh, Haman was actually a Persian advisor, and you and the Holy Prophet, you know, plagiarized it and added it in the Quran. 
Recently, recently they found papyrus showing Pharaoh, meaning Ramses II, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Musa, talking to somebody in hieroglyphics, calling him Haman, who was the one who was the engineer to make high buildings, tall buildings, and his name was Haman. And that was recently found in, in Egyptian findings, artifacts, where Haman was the name of the engineer of Pharaoh. Quran states him by name, where Pharaoh says, Ya Haman, O Haman, build me a tall ladder so I can go and fight the God of Musa. So the Quran, when it mentions, whether it's science, whether it's history, prediction of the future, you notice Quran, Allah is saying, I hold the secrets. And I have set a standard in the universe. You could be on the other side of the universe as a human being. Your qibla is earth. Do you know that? If I go to the moon at the time of salah, I have to face the earth because I'm Bani Adam. Adam means mud creature. But if I was to go to the other side of the earth, the universe, or even to the moon, do my morals and principles of the promotion of good and demotion of evil change? No. Watch even Star Trek and watch all these sci-fi movies, right? They've got all kinds of borgs and creatures. What's the discussion about in Hollywood? What is one thing you cannot escape? Indian Bollywood movies, Lollywood movies in Pakistan, Hollywood in... <laughs> there's one theme. The theme is there's a good guy and then there's the bad guy. And there's a fight between good and evil. There's nothing else. Hollywood, you break down all the movies, go study, you'll come out and say, I like that guy. Why? Oh, he's a good guy. This one was good. He lied. You watch, you read Shakespearean stories, Macbeth, you read Julius Caesar. What's it all about? When Brutus stabs Julius Caesar's A2 Brute, you know? So, okay, what's it about? You hypocrite. You even my enemy. It's all about Huck and Bartle. There is nothing you can read, even in love stories and novels. It's all about Huck and Bartle. Who's wrong, who's right? Who's good, who's bad? You go watch these Wrestling matches with these big, big guys oiled, you know, bouncing around like rubber balls. See, what is it all about? Good guy, bad guy, good guy, bad guy. They're all the same. You know that. They're all the same. This have to appear good guy, bad guy. Allah says, that's my system. I built it. And you all know that it's ugly to be with the bad guy. It's just not good. You watch those movies. The guys who take the bad positions... And they are very famous actors. For the rest of their lives, you always see them as the bad guy. Though they were just actors. But you just, I remember you were the criminal. You were that bad one who killed. And some people in Hollywood, that's all they do is the bad guy. Because they can't get any other job to be the good guy. It doesn't just, just doesn't look right anymore. You've just become the bad guy. But what is it about? It's about uprightness or their lack thereof. So when Allah says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَدِّيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ Keep your faces upright. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا حَنِيفًا meaning upright. Ibrahim is known as حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا Upright, submissive. Upright. It's all about upright. حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي This is the path of God. And God doesn't change the system. So if I went to the other side of the universe, even if I was on a spaceship and I met other kind of creatures and aliens, it's all about morals. It's all about cheating and lying and violating. The core principles of haq against batil is inescapable. Nothing you and I can do. Trust me. What I'm saying now, boil it down. Let us go home and reflect. Wow, that's so true. Every single day, it's all about good versus bad. That's what it's all about. So when someone asks me, why do you believe in Allah? I said, as a human being, there is nothing more precious to me. Even in entertainment, when I go watch a movie, it's about good versus bad. I have to choose whether I like the bad or I like the good. Who likes the bad? People who are angry. People 
who are dissatisfied with the rahmah of Allah. People who see the cup as half empty. See, I can see this cup as half full, half empty. Same cup, hasn't changed. Nothing has changed about this cup. You can say, what's this cup like? It says, oh, it's half full. Good. You know why? Because you feel like it's not full. You know why it's not full? You're grateful. Why are you grateful? Thank God, God left some room for me to fill it. So what do you do? You work to fill it. Because you're excited. But if I see this cup as half empty, I'll wonder, like, why wasn't it empty? Why wasn't it full? Why is it half empty? Ah, you do this and you spill everything. The one who does this is the one who's angry. The one who likes evil. The one who wants to step. The one who wants to kill. Saddam was like that. Saddam was raised on the streets. You know, he was a thug. His uncle raised him. A thief. Why? He was angry. Angry with God. Angry with the situation. And he felt that survival of the fittest is the one who's got the golden gun and can shoot in the air. He felt the gun was his way. You see? So he would go and shoot people without even blinking an eye. Boom, boom, boom. See? It works. Look, they're all scared of me. I walk into a room, they're all scared of me. Ibn Ziyad style. Ibn Ziyad was like that. Saddam is in the footsteps of Ibn Ziyad. Kill, kill, kill. Angry. But what ends up in the end? Allah says, قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرْ Go, see, see what happened to these people, the evildoers. What happened to Fir'aun? He had so much power, so much wealth, so much killing. He was so arrogant, wasn't he? Allah says, look at my system. He knew in the history that they will come among the children of Yaqub who will destroy him. And he said, yeah, I'm going to fight this God. I'm going to kill every Bani Israeli male child born. Allah says, he wants to play with me, this fool. You don't play with Allah. Allah sends Musa to his house. He says, okay, you kill. You're going to raise him. You want to see insult to injury? Fir'aun raises him. And he's stunned when he sees Musa as an adult. Didn't I raise you? Weren't you in my house? Musa says, I was. <laughs> and Fir'aun knew, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. That's the one that has been called for. Allah says, don't mess with me. Your job is to submit to the good. If you submit, When you let go of shaitan, let go of taghut, demigods, my own ego, my money, my evilness, my destructiveness, and start being good, start forgiving, start loving, start caring, start sharing, don't be stingy, start working for the good, and start counting that, you know what, if I'm 30, I will die soon, if I'm 50, I will die soon, if I'm 20, I will die soon, let's take a count, it's very quick this world, I'm telling us, Ask those who are 70, 80, ask them, how long did you live in this world? They say, yesterday I was like you. Just yesterday I was jumping around like you. Today I don't know what's happening. By the way, that soul, even in an old, old, old person, has not aged even a second. The soul, the ruh, and the nafs inside has not aged at all. It's as young as the day it was created. It's just the body has aged. Data has increased. Data points have increased. But the aging inside? No. As young as the day they were born. Believe me, Quran shows it. Even Ashab al-Kaf, when they went to sleep for 300 solar years, 309 lunar years, they said one day, maybe two days. Uzair, maybe a day, though he slept 100 years. Allah says, those who will be raised on judgment day, they'll be asked, how are they buried in the grave? He says, one day, maybe a little more. Because time stops. Allah says, this is a frame for you to work in. But this frame, don't take it in a belittling way. 
إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. What does it mean تواصوا بالصبر? In حق. Allah says by time man is at a loss except those who believe. See? And do good deeds. They promote justice. They promote truth. And they promote patience. Time is against us. Let's not waste it. If a person is 90 years old, 30 years of the 90, they were probably sleeping. 30 years. You look at a 30-year-old person, they'll say, I'm an older person now. 30, I'm a man. I'm a woman. 30 years I've lived on this earth. Yeah, a 90-year-old has been sleeping all that time. Right? Another 30 years, you were busy making a living. Go out and earn eight hours a day. And only 30 years has been left for your personal doings. And of the 30 years, break it down, you won't get more than a few hundred hours of video and write-ups about your life and my life. Do you know that? Somebody says, write your life. Give me your biography, autobiography. You and I can't write more than a few hours of video, video, video. So if you assess that, then you have to say, what am I in this world for? If I don't promote good and I don't work hard till I meet Allah, why do I exist? This is why it's so important to focus on Tawheed. When you understand Tawheed and its dynamics, you will not fall prey like our Christian brethren. What is Tawheed in Islam? Comparison. You will notice in Christianity, which by the way was not what Isa salam promoted. This is Pauline philosophy. Paul philosophy. You find in Christianity... Sadly, good people, but here's the problem. They propose the idea of love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Some will say, interpolation, he gave his only begotten son. But that's been expunged in many Bibles. He gave his only son. So what's the object of God's creation? Love. For God so loved. You'll hear many times when we speak our Christian brethren, we love. Do you Muslims love? Your God is not loving, they say. I said, beyond love. Our God is Rahman ar Rahim. Love is a subset of mercy. But love can also be bad. But Rahman has no negative. So even the use of terms in Islam is correct. But let me ask you a question. A loving God, when I debate Christians, and I respect them, I said, your God is very loving, isn't he? They said, yes. I said, based on your arguments, since according to you, Adam made a mistake, he's very loving, why didn't he forgive Adam, since he's so loving? I want you to think carefully. A very loving God is a forgiving God. Adam made a mistake, supposedly. I don't say that. They say that. According to our school, Adam made no mistake. Even in the Muslim world, there are people who say, Adam made a mistake. Adam salam, did not make a mistake. Not a mistake at all. Please understand this. He's a prophet of Allah. Angels bowed to him. He is protected. He made no mistake. It was already decreed for him to come to earth. But just as a quick example, since the Christians say that, so I asked them, since God is so loving, why did he just not forgive him? They said, he can't. He cannot. I said, that's not an omnipotent God. That's not an almighty God. He can't. He cannot. He chose not to. Oh, then he's not loving. He's vindictive. You know what vindictive means? He likes to hold a grudge. Vengeance. He's a just God, they say. Is he? How is he just? By me inheriting his sin? That's justice? What legal system on earth can dare say that Mr. X commits a crime and I hold Mr. Y liable? This is breach of justice. This is a violation of justice. If I hold A, A commits a crime, 
but you love A so much, you take B and you kill him. This is breach, violation of justice. Islam doesn't propose this idea at all. The notion of damnation followed by salvation has been created by a group of people to rule the minds of the people through fear. Fear of hell. Damnation followed by salvation. Meaning the barakah of God only comes after you are saved. So every child born is damned and doomed. This is not a loving God. With due respect, the Tawheed here is highly problematic. A God who damns me, but you go to the Old Testament, even in the New, you find none shall bear the burden of the other. Hmm. Quran says, وَلَا تَزِرُوا وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى Nobody earns the deeds of others. وَلَا تَزِرُوا وَازِرَةٌ You are independent. In أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ When you do good, you do good for yourselves. If my forefathers committed a crime, why should I be held liable for it? Maybe materially I will suffer, but not spiritually. You cannot damn me for that. That's not a loving God. In Islam, we follow the basic principles as follows. A civil society, any civil society will tell you that a community, assuming we became the governor of this town, and you are all its citizens, if I was the legislator, and I'm a just legislator, and I'm a loving just legislator, and I am a caring legislator, I have to assume every one of you is innocent until proven guilty. Whereas in Christianity, with due respect, we're all guilty until proven innocent. There's a big difference here, brothers and sisters. I'm just scratching the surface. Why is Islam on the trajectory of growth? From 1934 to 1984, in 50 years, Islam wasn't very popular in the media then. 234% was the growth of Islam. 234, more than double. That's a lot. You know what the population was? 136%. So that means more people who were non-Muslims became Muslims. Why? Because it's deen al-haqq. It's common sense. Tawheed is natural. It attracts you. Allah in Islam doesn't say you are chosen people and the rest of you are the scum of the earth and you'll go to hell. And I've only chosen these people even if they occupy the lands, they murder people, they, they kill people, they put walls around people, they are unjust and they shoot them all the time. But they are my chosen people because God has chosen them. This level of Tawheed is unjust. This kind of a God does not exist. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Doesn't exist. Allah, he says, He says, The religion of Allah has been decreed. It will supersede all religions. But here we're not talking about superseding in ruling the people, in taking governments, and in taking lands, and making it Islamic states. No. It is not the intent in the Quran of such objects. No. This notion, let us take a country, make it Islamic, and then we knock people out, and any kafir, Christian, Jew, we force them to become Muslims. This is not in Islam. Whoever did this is outside the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many examples I give you. When the Christians of Najran came, Allah says to them, Qul ya ahl al-kitab ta'alaw. In the end of the verse, Allah says, and if they reject, tell them you are Muslims. God didn't say, oh Prophet, grab them. Shoot them. Imprison them. Force them. Even when Khaybar fell, the Jews of Khaybar in Medina, on the outskirts of Medina, when they were defeated by the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave them the keys of Khaybar. He didn't say, you must become Muslims. He says, we will continue to trade with you. We will continue to have relations, but equitably. 
You want to see something even greater than that? When the Messenger وسلم, took over Mecca, the man who was in charge of the Kaaba was an idol worshiper. He had the key to the Kaaba. It's like the governor of the city, like the president. And that person was terrified when the Holy Prophet came because he knew he had lost his job. The Prophet calls him, says, where are you? He comes. He says, you will continue to hold the keys of the Kaaba. A mushrik. The Prophet said, that's right. You and I many times, oh, Hindu is najis. Oh, this one, kafir. Please don't touch me. I'm, I'm tahir. This damnation, condemnation, this alleged purification of pointing fingers in a condescending way is not within Islam. It's not Islam. The messenger gave the key back and says, you hold the key. The man was so impressed with the Holy Prophet. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi. This is the akhlaq we're talking about. The akhlaq of kindness, gentleness. Fir'aun, a wretched man. Allah didn't say go strike him. Force him to be a Muslim. Go talk to him. Idhab ila Fir'aun. Inna utaha. He has exceeded his boundary. And when you speak to him, says qawlan layina. Use a soft tongue. Don't be harsh to him. This is a murderer. A child murderer. A reckless, egotistic monster. Beat him up, we would say. Not in the prescriptions of Al-Islam. The religion itself means peace. This Islamophobia that's prevalent in Canada and in North America is being fueled by enemies. That one person becomes Muslim and then he carries a gun. Ah, Islam caused him to do this. There's more terrorism taking place in South America right now as we speak. In a Christian state, South America, Mexico, go to the CIS statistics and see how much killing takes place in a day in Mexico. But no one talks about that form of terrorism. All you need is one person appearing to look like Islam and the media is jumping at it. It says, ah, Islam caused this guy to be a killer. There are many non-Muslims who kill too. When I was interviewed after 9-11, I was asked that question, you know, well, Bin Laden this says, listen, first of all, we don't know. If you're claiming that he did it, he's wrong. Whoever did it, I pray God destroys them. Whoever did 9-11, insha'Allah, in these nights of Muharram, insha'Allah, amineen, will be destroyed. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. By the same token, anyone who has used 9-11 to go kill more, inshallah, will be destroyed too. Because we love peace and justice. Islam is not a religion of injustice. So when I was interviewed, she says, yeah, but you know, I said, why have you called? I said to her, why have you associated Islam with this heinous act? Who authorized you to do this? This is very uncanny. This is very uh, immature in your part. In fact, this is extremely dangerous. She says, well, he's been reading the Quran. He quotes the Quran. I said, so if somebody quotes the Quran, you bring Islam into it? I said, well, if that's the case, David Koresh in Waco, Texas, was reading the Bible forwards and backwards. He had armed himself pretty well to have a big fight with the American government. How come you, the media, didn't call him a Christian terrorist? Hmm. She leaned back, she says, gee, no one ever asked me such a question. I said, you earn seven figures, I would advise you to do your homework. Because what you're saying reaches out to millions of people. And the poison that sits into their minds may be the cause of the deaths that are taking place in the world. The O'Reilly factor kind of ones. The Sean Hannity factor kinds of ones. Stop. Islam is a religion of peace. It is a religion guided by great personalities. Tonight, we discuss a personality of the highest moral character who was with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Why do we talk about Karbala? When we talk about good versus evil, we will scan the earth and the skies. You won't find better representatives than the representatives we have among the prophets and the Ahlul Bayt. Honestly, you won't find them. Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and his family and his companions, 
second to none. That's why this revolution continues to grow. When I sit up here, I say to the other speakers, I say, did you notice how easy our work is? We don't have to market. We don't have to advertise. We don't have to entice. Everybody comes. They flock these places. All massages around the world right now. Hundreds of millions of people. Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. The world is wondering, who is this Hussein ibn Ali alayhi The mission, the revolution of Imam Hussein alayhi is flying towards Allah. Allah promised him and he's getting it. Look, the enemy is dying. They're marketing. They're spending billions. Those enemies, the Bani Umayyah today, are pouring billions to stop this. They can't. The Banu Abbas it used to kill, behead people. They used to chop their hands if you approach the Haram of Hussein ibn Ali. Did you know that? Alayhi salatu wasalam. If you just approach it, they used to kill, her, kill them. Why? Why the fear? Saddam even shot bombs and he shot bullets at the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Why? Because they are sha'air Allah, signs of God. Allah subhanahu elevates them in the Quran says fi buyutin adhin Allah an turfa'a wa yudhkara fi hasmu yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghuduwi wal asal rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wala bay'an an dhikrillah wa iqami salati wa ita'i zakati yaqulun man tatakallabu fihi al qulub wal absar what did i just recite in houses that god has elevated through his name. And they are remembered as a means to Allah. And they become the iconic symbols of going towards the wasila, as we say, the shafa, because they become the guidelines like Rasulullah. If you and I claim to say, La ilaha illallah, without Muhammadur Rasulullah, we are not Muslims. The second part must be said. If we don't say it, we are not Muslims. Just like if we do not obey the command of Allah, that Allah commanded even the angels to bow to Adam, the ones who refused was Iblis. Those who refuse today to love the agents of Allah are no different than Iblis of the time of Adam. Salawat Muhammad wa Muhammad. So uh, the personality, I know this community especially, I know our Shia community, the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, Shia, Sunni, doesn't matter. We love Abbas ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. We love him. Who is he? He was a young man in Karbala. And he was loved by Imam Hussein as his brother. As you know, his mother, Abbas's mother, was Fatima, known as Ummul Banin, mother of sons. She gave birth to four sons, Abbas, Abdullah, Ja'far, and Uthman, four sons. All four of them were in Karbala. History. When Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayha, salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. When Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayha, was about to leave this world, as you know, she left at a very young age. She was a teenager. Imagine the blessed mother of Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Zainab, Um Kulthum. This blessed mother left this dunya at a very young age. I want us to remember that. We don't know where she's buried. No one knows. You know why? Because the dhulam was done on her. She suffered. She cried a lot. She cried a lot. When the Holy Prophet was leaving this dunya, he whispered into his only daughter, Fatima, he said, my blessed daughter. You know, he only had one child, daughter, Fatima to Zahra. The other two sons had died. And we know the Prophet only had one daughter, not others. Because in Mubahila, when the Christians came, the Quran says, Abna'ana wa abna'akum wa nisa'ana wa nisa'akum wa anfusana wa anfusakum. Mubahila was this confrontation with the Christians to pray for the curse of the liars. The verse is Nisa'ana, our women. This was in the last year of the Prophet's mission in Medina. 
All his wives were there. His supposed other daughters were there. Not one showed up on that one. They couldn't. Because Nisa'ana was only one woman. Fatima al-Zahra, salamullahi alayhi. This is mentioned even in Sahih of Muslim. The Prophet held Imam Hussein in his arm, Imam Hassan in his arm, on his left hand. Behind him was just one woman, Fatima al-Zahra, and behind her was Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the Prophet looked up, he says, Allahumma inna ha'ulai ahlu bayti wa khasati wa ammati. Lahmuhum lahmi wa damuhum dami. Ana harbun liman harabahum wa silmun liman salamahum. Wa aduwun liman a'adahum. You know who was killed in Karbala? The Prophet was killed in Karbala. Yazid butchered the Prophet. You might say, no, the Prophet left 51 years prior to that. He said, no. Because the Prophet said, Hussein no minni wa ana min al Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Lahmuhum lahmi. Their flesh is my flesh. Wa damuhum dami. Their blood is my blood. And I harbon, I make war with those who make war with them. And I make peace with those who make peace with them. And I make enemies with those who are their enemies. So who was the enemy in Karbala? Enemies of Rasulullah who killed Rasulullah. So Fatima the Zahra, before she is leaving this dunya, in this state of dhulam, as the Prophet is whispering in her ears before her death, as you know, she died very shortly after the messenger. He whispered in her ears and she smiled. She cried, actually, the first one. She cried. Then the second one, she smiled. So Aisha, one of the wives of the Holy Prophet, asked her after the messenger left this dunya, she said, what did your father tell you that made you these two reactions? She says, the first one he told me was that Allah has decreed his departure soon, and I cried to lose my father. But then he said to me, soon after me, Fatima, you're going to join me. You're going to come to me. She says, I smiled. A lot of the long. I can't talk about it tonight. She says to Imam Ali, alayhi salam, she says, Before my after my departure, I want you to marry another woman. Marry someone who will give you strong sons. Because my son, Hussein, my father told me, we'll be left alone on the battlefield and there'll be no one to help him. <laughs> Imam Ali alayhi salam goes to Jafar, Jafar his brother. He says, Jafar, you're an expert in genealogy. He says, there is a woman who comes from a generation who gives strong sons. That's why Imam married Fatima, Umm al as his other wife. And she bore him four sons, four valiant, powerful sons. The leader was Abbas. He was married and had children, had son. And what you find is Abbas now is in Karbala. We see that he was like a shadow. Historians say that from childhood, Abbas alayhi salam, Loved Imam Hussein so much as a because he was a much younger brother. Anywhere Imam would go, he'd be running. He sees Imam look a little thirsty, <laughs> he'd go and look for water for his brother. Imam looks at him, knowing that tomorrow you will also protect me on the battlefield. He says, I love you too much, my brother, my Imam. <laughs> Historians say Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he was fighting in Safin, in Safin, they saw a young boy who moved like Ali ibn Abi Talib. His movements were like Ali ibn Abi Talib, fluent, bold, fast, striking the enemy. Young boy. He says, who is this little Ali ibn Abi Talib? Imam Ali alayhi salam, trained him to fight the art of defense. You know who taught Imam Ali to fight? The Holy Prophet. Imam Ali says, I learned the art of defense through my Holy Prophet, my Prophet. He taught me. So what happens? You find the same Abbas now is an adult, tall, 
strong. When Walid calls him into the house in Medina, Abbas is standing with his hand on the sword. He says, I have no, I have no hesitation to defend my master. رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ When Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهِ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ He bought the self of the believers. وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ And their wealth for paradise. Who are they? يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَيَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ They kill and they get killed. This is Abbas standing unafraid. He's in Karbala. Brothers and sisters, tonight, his shahada, we mention momentous shahada. We give this long alams. As you know, alam means what? Flag. We say, Abbas alam daram. Who is alam daram? One who carries the flag. You will notice in any battle, the flag carrier is the strongest. When his flag holds, the army is winning. When the flag falls, you're losing. That's why Abbas was the flag bearer. When the battle started on the day of Ashura, the center flank that was getting the most attack was Abbas ibn Ali on the front line, holding fort and nobody could come near him. He would strike them like Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, the way he struck Amr bin Abdwood and the way he struck Marhab and split them in half. This is how Abbas was. Imam Hussein was so proud to see him. Abbas was always there standing tall. Anybody came even near his brother, his imam, he would stand there and says, what do you want? Story goes, Shimr al Joshun, the enemy of Allah, tries to create fitna while he's with Ibn Ziyad. He's sending a letter, a final letter. Ibn Ali, alayhi salam's head should be brought. Either he gives bay'ah or kill him. Shimr says to Ibn Ziyad, give freedom to Abbas and his three brothers because we are distantly related. Shimr al Joshan was a distant relative of Abbas through his mother. When Abbas salam, gets the letter, Ibn, as you know, Shimr comes to Karbala. And when he gets the letter, he reads it. He says, Shim, Shim, you know, Shimr hereby through the authority of the governor Ibn Ziyad gives you freedom, you and your three brothers. Look at the fitna. He takes the letter, he rips it in front of Shimr. He says, shame on you. How dare you give me freedom when the representative of Allah, you will behead him and I should get freedom. He steps on the letter and says, get out of my face. This is Abbas ibn Ali. The one who fought from a young age, defending, defending, defending. Now the day of Ashura comes. In the daytime, in the afternoon, all the companions have been killed. The children have been put aside. Even the little infant is the final one tomorrow. The day after tomorrow we'll talk. The first person, by the way, among the Ahl al-Bayt to become a shaheed, we'll talk about him tomorrow, is Ali al-Akbar, the son of Imam Hussein, the, el, the second eldest son. You find Abbas salam, is ready now. Everybody has been killed, is ready to go. He bids goodbye to Imam Hussein salam. He says, my time has come. We need to go and fight and give our souls to this cause for the sake of maintaining Islam. Imam says, the children are thirsty. We are thirsty. Parched. As you know, 7th of Muharram, the water stopped. By the tenth of Muharram, there was no water. They were dry. Their mouths were dry. The babies were crying. If you touched their tongues, it was dry. Atash, as we say, al atash. So Imam Hussein says to Abbas, his brother, can you make one attempt to break that Euphrates so that you can bring some water for these children? Abbas says yes, and he alight. He gets on the horse and he goes towards the enemy. Historians say as he reaches the Euphrates, you know, Euphrates wasn't nearby because Imam Hussain was moved away from the Euphrates. So now he's going towards the Euphrates. And as they say, they say when he arrived towards the enemies, the enemy got scared because Abbas was valiant. You couldn't get near him. He would destroy you the way Amir al-Mu'minin destroyed. So Abbas sees the flanks moving. He comes near the water. They move. They don't resist him. They're scared. And Abbas gets off his horse. He takes the mishk, this skin to carry water. And he puts it in the river. Can you imagine Abbas, how thirsty he was? 
You know, historians say he never put the water in his mouth. He says, I can't put this water in my mouth. When my master has not gotten his water, how can I drink? I can't do that. He fills it up, puts it in his right arm, gets on the horse. They say Zayd ibn Waraka and Hakim bin Tufail, two enemies from Yazid army, were behind trees. And as Abbas is riding, galloping towards the tents, looking at his little, at his little niece, Sakina, she's crying. She says, Abbas, Abu John, come, I need this water, I'm thirsty. And as he's riding, they say Zayd bin Baraka jumps and cuts the right arm of Imam of Abbas alayhi Abbas is so furious, he's Wallah in Katatum Yamini. He takes this, moves it, puts it on his left arm. So his arm has fallen. And then it's going towards that. They said, Hakim bin Tufail comes and hits him on the other side, and his other arm falls, and the Mishk falls on the ground. And they start shooting with arrows and the water spills out. Abbas says, my mission, I will not get this water to them. He says, alaykum salam, alaykum minni salam, ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein." Imam Hussein sees the flag fallen. The minute he sees it fallen, he says, my brother has been killed. My, mother, my brother has been removed from this world. And Abbas breathes his last. Ala la ala tullah ala al-qawm al-dhalimeen. Wa sayyaramu al-ladhina dhalamu ayyamun qalabin yan qalibun. Let's make dua. My brothers and sisters, tonight, this Islamic center, just quick note, is a barakah. This center has $1.4 million in debt. It's paying interest. It's bought the land next door. I don't think it's fair. That the community where Allah's name is mentioned, where children's lives get protected and saved for the akhirah, that 1.4 million should be owed to a bank. Get rid of it, please. Loan it. Give it charity. Get rid of this bala. No interest in Islamic centers. We have done many projects. One thing I can't thank Allah enough, we've never paid any interest. Why should the banks get rich? Please, help out. I'll talk more about this. You, the young generation, get involved in these centers. This is our future. Abbas stood next to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He was young. He said, I protect till I die. You and I must follow in the path of Abbas alayhi salatu wasalam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muthara idha da'a wa yakshifu su أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ two more times أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد